Hey, stop right there. Pause this episode and leave Unexplained Encounters a rating or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks. It's not often I can narrate a story to you that comes with a creepy photo of an alleged demon or creature of some sort. Today's third story is a long one, but if you wait till the end of it, you'll see those unsettling photos. There will also be links in the description in case you're listening through a podcast app. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails to see my sweet picture of a half-eaten Big Mac. Today I've got an assortment of stories featuring monsters seen during hikes, creepy cabins in the woods, and demons that love to torment children. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your most terrifying stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org, or go to eeriecast.com for more scary podcasts like this. Now, let's begin. Cabin at the Top of the Hill From Cyber Bunny Bell I don't know how to start this, or to even continue it, without seeming absolutely insane. But I know what happened, and I know that it did happen. I just don't know how or why. I'm sure many of you reading this have seen those glitch in the matrix types of videos, whether it be compilations, reactions, or by the person themselves, so you may have an idea of what I'm sharing here. These events are mind-boggling, terrifying, and confusing. Honestly, I'm not sure what I experienced exactly. I can't be sure what happened to me when I went camping that weekend. My mother and her friend, and current boyfriend named John, always loved camping. My mom herself loved it since the day I was born. My first camping trip was around the time I was five, somewhere in Pennsylvania, but that's not related. All you need to know is that my mom loves camping and bringing a friend or two with her, alongside my sister and I. I think it was somewhere in upstate New York, at the bottom of a hill. It was somewhat of a field, with the woods surrounding it up until you got to the top of the hill, where the woods retreated once again. I don't remember much of the geography of the area, except for where I experienced it. Sunset was approaching, and I was on a hike in the woods, heading to the tip of the hill. Considering it wasn't too high, I could have likely made it back down before it got dark. However, that would prove to be false, when I came across a large house at the top of the hill. The chimney was puffing out smoke, and the house had a very fairy tale like cottage vibe. The entire house was made up of logs, like those cabins you'd find out in the woods where the stereotypical hunter might live. But it was a bright yellow-brown shade, and it was about the height of an average colonial house in the suburbs, with four windows in the front, two on the upper floor, and two on the lower floor, both engulfed by light from the inside of the house. Being the curious and admittedly stupid seven-year-old I was, I approached the door. Before I even knocked, a pale blonde girl, likely my age, opened it. A much older man stood beside her. The interior of the home was single-floored, almost having a church-like aesthetic to it a high ceiling with a bright chandelier hanging from it and the furniture being placed against the wall. Really all I remember of that place was what the girl and I did though. We made a bracelet together, a friendship bracelet. You know how fast kids become friends. It was like that. I remember the man telling me to leave the house before it got dark out and the girl asking me to return the following day. I was a fairly lonely child so having a new friend was great. Even if we lived hours apart, I could see her again, and her, who I assumed was her grandfather, and my mother could exchange numbers to set up more hangouts in the future. As I walked down the hill through the thick trees, a bit near my campsite, I saw a bonfire. I assumed it was some sort of camp activity, since it was a communal area, and I thought that my mom and sister would be there too. When I got there, it was a bit away from my campsite, and near a lone ranch, where a woman was making s'mores by herself. When she saw me, 
she invited me over. Seeing s'mores, I obviously accepted. What I remember from this experience was making a s'more or two with her, then leaving. When I got back to my campsite, they were doing the same things they were doing before, grilling and playing games. They didn't seem to be worried where I'd been, assuming I just went hiking, which is what I said I would be doing beforehand. An irresponsible thing for a parent to do, I know, but thankfully she had become a lot more attentive towards me in the following months and years. The next morning I headed off, telling my mom I was going to go hiking, again. She seemed concerned, so she gave me a whistle, like an emergency whistle for my safety. Then I left, going back up the hill to see my new friend, with the bracelet in my pocket. But once I got to the top of the hill again, the house was gone. Not a trace of it remained, almost as if it weren't even there to begin with. Confused and scared a bit, I turned away, heading back down the hill, looking for the ranch to see if that woman who shared s'mores with me would know of anything. As I said, the hill was extremely easy to navigate, so remembering my way to the ranch was not difficult. When I got there, however, the place looked dilapidated, old. The paint was peeling and there were some holes in the walls. Assuming the darkness hid these details from me in the night, I decided to keep walking towards it. As I did, the state of the house began to look worse and worse until I was close enough to actually touch it. The fire pit was bare and rusted. The entire property looked like it had been abandoned for decades, and that woman was nowhere to be seen. I ran back to my campsite in a confused panic my mom becoming immediately concerned. I blamed it on a bear. I told her that I accidentally ran into one. That caused her to be fearful. We packed and left that afternoon, and we haven't been back. I'm 18 years old now. I haven't told anyone in my family, nor anyone that was there with me that day. I don't know what I experienced. I know it was real. I even had that bracelet up until a custody battle, where most of my things were thrown away in my father's pitiful rage. I wish I could explain what happened, to make it make sense, but you can't explain something nonsensical in a reasonable way. So what do you think? What did I experience? I don't know, and sometimes I'm relieved about that. Sometimes for your own safety, your own sanity, it's best not to know. Whispering Demon From It's Ya Boy Todd When I was about nine, my family decided to get rid of the carpet in most of our home. So my parents had to send us to live temporarily with my aunt and uncle for a few weeks to get us out of the way. I was excited to be away from home for so long, pretending like I lived in a different house. Nothing was wrong with our home, I was just a weird kid, I guess. There lived my three cousins, the youngest, Mary, being a year older than me. I was going to stay in her room. In the other room was her two older brothers, Tim and Jake, who shared a room. My little brother Jay was still a baby, so he was staying in my aunt and uncle's room in his crib. I was excited to have a two-week-long sleepover with my favorite cousin. Little did I know, it would be one of the most prominent ghost encounters I would ever have. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal. I was raised around pagan beliefs and Wiccan practices. Nothing super crazy, just cleansing and simple candle magic kinds of things. My point is, I was aware of the supernatural even at that age. My first few days there were completely normal. I didn't sense anything. There were times in the night I would get scared of the dark, feel unease at the quietness of the room, but I was a nine-year-old with ADHD. It didn't really ring any alarm bells for me. The third night was when that thing decided to start toying with me. Anytime I was close to falling asleep, I would hear a psst from my cousin's closet. 
Afraid, I pulled my blanket up over my head to protect myself, and eventually I would fall asleep. The next morning, I didn't feel a presence like I did the night before, probably because I was distracted by the smell of pancakes, so I quickly forgot about the ordeal, until night fell again. Because the same thing happened, only a little louder. Psst. This time, I decided to wake my cousin up, but she refused to wake up. No matter how hard I shook her, yelled at her, nothing. I even slapped her at one point. Afraid if I tried again, she might wake up and punch me, I decided to leave her alone after that. I slumped back on the pull-out bed and brought my knees to my chest. I scanned the dark room for a sign of anything, praying that I would find nothing out of the ordinary. I then kept my eyes locked onto her closet, watching for movement. My ears rang with the silence as I focused on any tiny noise. As I mentioned before, I have ADHD, so the silence wasn't something I liked. It felt like a loud, ringing dog whistle scraping at my ears and brain. The room got darker. I know that eyes just do that sometimes, especially when the dark doesn't allow the brain to register details. But my nine-year-old brain thought I was going crazy. I don't know if it was just my eyes being weird or the spirit messing with me, but either way, I was terrified. Eventually, I would fall asleep once more. The bright protection of the sun brought me peace, but soon that wouldn't stop whatever had been messing with me. Things of mine began to go missing. At first, I thought it was my own negligence. I was a very forgetful kid, but when things like a hairbrush, which I knew I sat on the sink, went missing just a few hours after I'd done so, I started to ask my older cousins if they were messing with me. They swore they weren't, but the boys were known to mess with their sister in the same way so my aunt got involved. After ransacking their room like a prison guard, she found nothing. She suggested I must have put it away and didn't remember. Being the airhead I was, I just accepted that as a possibility. I would also hear my name being called by my aunt and uncle, but when I asked them about this, they would tell me they never called for me. Same with my cousins. I soon became irritable. I begged my aunt to let me and my cousin sleep downstairs on the couch, maybe play a movie for background noise. But she refused my request. I held back tears as I huffed my blanket and pillow back to my cousin's room. My cousin asked why I was so upset, calling me a baby. My cousins liked to bully me for being scared of the dark, so I didn't tell her why. I simply said I don't like the quiet. Just sing a song in your head till we fall asleep, she said, trying to comfort me. We set my bed up, and she crawled into hers. We talked for a little while until she stopped answering me. I peeked over at the closet. The silence enveloped the room, and the ringing was back. I put my pillow over my head, singing a Hannah Montana song in my head. The chorus repeated over and over. I couldn't sleep for what felt like hours. Tears stung my eyes as I started to hear the psst again. My back was to the rest of the room. My spine felt this intense presence around me. It was as if it was right behind me. Somehow I knew it was smiling wide and evil. Soon my quiet cries lulled me to sleep in a dehydrated exhaustion. But quickly my slumber was snatched away as I felt the blanket being slowly pulled off of me, slipping off my legs and falling onto the floor. Horrified, I yanked it back up. Without moving the pillow from my head, I pulled the blanket all the way up to my shoulder. This would repeat throughout the night, never pulling very hard, but just enough to wake me up so that I would notice. Eventually, I woke up in the morning, my blanket and pillow on the floor next to me. I tried to pass it off as just me moving in my sleep, but I couldn't shake the feeling that that wasn't the case. Over the next few days, the same things would happen. My things would go missing. Messes I didn't make would appear. 
At one point, my aunt gave my brother to me to hold while she went to the bathroom. My cousin and I had been playing in her room. My baby brother immediately began to squirm in my arms and push me away. He started to cry and say things like, don't like it, and go, go, which was his way of telling me he wanted to leave. I couldn't just let him go, so I decided to pick him up and leave the room. I thought his problem was being held, or my aunt no longer being with him, but the moment I left that room, he calmed down and rested his head on my shoulder. I looked back at the room, suddenly feeling the weight of unease. My face must have looked horrified because my cousin asked if I was okay. I told her, nothing's wrong, I'm just staring, sorry. Later, my aunt told my cousin and I to clean her room because of the mess we made when playing. She told my cousin that her room had better be spotless by dinner. That gave us about 40 minutes or so. We'd barely finished shoving toys in her closet when her mom called us down. Later, we were downstairs watching TV with my uncle when Tim, the middle child, told us we were so dead. Mary and I looked at each other and quickly made our way upstairs to a toy crime scene in Mary's room. Her mom had her hands on her hips with fury on her face. I told you to clean this room, she yelled. We did, right? Mary turned to me to confirm. I nodded. Then what is this? My aunt gestured with both hands all around the room. It was then I noticed what really happened. Everything from the closet had been thrown out. Toys were even broken or smashed. Jake and Tim did this. We really did clean the room. My cousins were all little monsters, so my aunt didn't know what to believe. Tired, my aunt just sighed and stepped over the mess. Just clean it, she said. My cousin sucked through her teeth and angrily threw her toys back in the closet. I stared at it. I had a sick feeling that the boys did not do any of this. I felt eyes staring at me. The dark corner the room's light didn't touch peered back at me, pulling me. We finished cleaning the room again and we got ready for bed. I dreaded the awful moment when my aunt turned off the light and shut the door. Before she left, I found the courage to ask her to close the closet. She laughed a little and slid it shut. I knew that meant nothing, but it gave nine-year-old me some peace for a little bit. She shut the door and blew kisses at us. My cousin and I did our nightly routine talking session before she knocked out for the night. Then I did my routine, which was to stare daggers at that closet until I drifted off to sleep. To my surprise, I slept pretty soundly for a few hours. Then I woke up to the sound of naked feet smacking against the wooden floor outside the door. It sounded as if a child was running up and down the hallway. Sometimes it sounded like the child stood in front of the door and just stomped in place. This would go on for a while. Mary, I'd whisper harshly. Mary, I repeated. Just like before, Mary did not wake up. Eventually, I fell asleep, until yet again I felt that presence behind me. That spidey sense you get when someone is in the room, but times ten. The hairs on my neck stood up as I heard the door handle creak, the door swinging open slowly. I was faced away from it, terrified to turn around or open my eyes. I could feel whatever it was creeping closer to me. Suddenly, I felt a small hand on my shoulder. I instantly turned, smacking the body behind me as hard as I could. Unfortunately, I had just smacked my baby brother. His face scrunched up, his mouth opened, and he began to wail. I gasped and immediately took him into my arms. I'm so sorry, I tightened my hug. I thought you were a ghost. What's happening? Mary groggily asked, waking up. Jay got out of his crib. I'm going to go put him back. Mary gave a noise of acknowledgement and I picked up Jay. I took him to the bathroom to check his face. He was fine, just dramatic. I sighed with relief. I stared at him as he sniffed. Are you okay? 
I asked. He nodded and opened his arms, asking to be picked up. I complied and carried him across the hallway that overlooked the living room. A few windows illuminated the house with moonlight. I tried sticking to the lighter spots of the hallway. Slowly, I opened my aunt's door, suddenly realizing it was completely closed. Before I opened it, I whispered, How did you get out? to my brother. Sadly, my brother had a hard time with words. He was in speech therapy. He didn't really know how to answer me. All he said was, Bed. It was too vague to try and guess what that meant, so I just entered the room, sneaking past my aunt and uncle, heading over to the crib. It was there I realized he had gathered his pillows to climb over the crib and onto my aunt and uncle's bed. At that point, I wasn't sure if anything of that night was really paranormal. My brother was known for making escape acts, and the sounds of feet could have been him. Then again, he had been wearing a onesie that night, which covered his feet. And the crib was in the corner of the room, not next to the bed, but they could have moved it closer. I don't know for sure. My last few nights were the same. Things would move in the room. I heard knocks and bumps, and of course the infamous psst. But my last night was the worst. Whatever it was, it would not let me sleep at all. Anytime I tried, things would happen. My blanket would get tugged. I would get poked. I felt as if bugs were crawling all over me at one point. The worst of it all was when nothing happened, because I knew then it was just waiting for me to fall asleep to do something. Sometimes I would see shadows pass the light under the door. One time, it looked like someone bit down to look under the door. When the sky became blue again, I thanked the gods, because that meant in a few short hours, my mom would come to save me from this horrid place. I closed my eyes, hoping this meant the thing would stop messing with me. I drifted off once more. The ringing silence enveloped my ears, the light hum of the air conditioner blowing down on us. Then in the darkest part of the room came the worst noise I will never forget. Jordan. A quick and grungy whisper in my ear, my name. It spoke my name directly to me. I kept my eyes tightly closed, my heart beating out of my chest. I could almost see what it looked like. Always that smile, that wide, skin-cracking smile. I spent my last few hours of the night under my blanket, fighting to keep it over my head as the blanket was tugged a few times. Eventually, my cousin woke up, stepping over me to go to the bathroom. It was morning enough for the sun to be above the mountains. I thanked the gods once more, and accidentally fell asleep under the blanket. I woke up to my mom in the room, smiling at me, telling me it was time to go. I launched out of the bed, hugging her. Let's go, I yelled. I grabbed my bag and stuffed my things in it. Suddenly I felt dizzy, my body jerking up. I looked around. It was my cousin's room. Dark. I was sitting on that pull-out bed. I looked over at her Hello Kitty clock. It read 12.47 a.m. I'll never forget the time. I flopped back onto the pillow and sobbed into it. None of that was real. I decided to force myself to stay awake. I got bored like any kid, and I snuck downstairs. I turned on the TV and kept it at a low volume. Of course, I ended up falling asleep on the couch. My uncle woke me up as he was leaving for work. He asked what I was doing up so early. I couldn't sleep. I got scared, I said, trying to win some sympathy points for having the TV on all night. He smiled and patted my head. All right, just keep it down. Then he left for work. I ended up pinching myself to make sure I was actually awake this time. For the remainder of the morning, it was pretty calm and normal. The family woke up one by one, grabbing their own breakfasts. My mom eventually came to come pick me up, and I couldn't leave fast enough. Honestly, I was a bit messed up for a while, thinking I was dreaming when I wasn't, that I was going to wake up in that room again. Luckily, that wasn't the case. 
Who knows? Maybe I'm still in that room nine years old, being tormented by my cousin's closet demon. The author of the following story provided some photos, two of which are quite creepy. If you're listening on YouTube, you'll see them on the video towards the end of the story. If you're listening via podcast, I'll leave links in the show notes, aka description. Don't go where the shadows lurk. From Pay West. During our life, each one of us, or at least most of us, has seen a dose of fear and trauma. A feeling that keeps us awake at night, rattles us whenever we're trying to fall into our warm nightly slumber. Even a brief innocent shut-eye feels like it leaves us vulnerable to whatever evil may be lurking close by. Personally, I've seen my fair share of the unknown and unexplained. Most of it has fascinated me. However, some of these events have left me with scars for life. This particular incident might be the worst of them. Three years ago, my friends, L, A, and I, decided to embark on an exciting camping trip. We're seasoned campers. We'd gone on camping trips many times before. This time, however, we aimed to make the journey longer and more memorable. Eager to find the perfect destination, we scoured the internet for the best places to visit. Our search led us to the intriguing and mysterious Gomi Fela, nestled high up in the Halgird mountain range a towering peak in our region. Its name, which translated to Pond of Deception in our language, piqued our curiosity. Determined to unravel the tale surrounding it, we set off, oblivious to the extraordinary adventure ahead. We couldn't resist the allure of uncovering its secrets firsthand. As we made our preparations, A stumbled upon a series of unsettling accounts while doing research. Stories whispered of inexplicable occurrences, Gomi Fela had a dark history. It was rumored that several unexplained deaths had taken place at the pond. The bodies found were said to have large holes in their chests, their organs mysteriously missing. Though the authorities attributed these deaths to drowning, the peculiar circumstances and lack of evidence raised suspicion. Drowning simply didn't explain the holes in their chests. Adding to that, there were no authentic photographs of the place, as the police wanted to discourage people from visiting. Despite the unsettling information, our sense of adventure overshadowed any possibilities of danger. We were eager to experience the untouched beauty of the clearing, unraveling the truth behind the stories. Determined, we prepared ourselves mentally, gathering the necessary camping gear. A couple of days later, our backpacks packed and excitement coursing through our veins, we set out on the journey. The drive to Gomi Fala was a long one, stretching for 12 hours through winding mountain roads and scenic valleys. We made only essential stops, driven by our eagerness to reach our destination before nightfall. As we neared the foot of Halgard, the imposing mountain said to house the mystical pond, a sense of anticipation and wonder filled the air. Turning onto a dirt path, we left the comfort of civilization behind, venturing into the heart of nature's grandeur. The dense tree line enveloped us, creating a tunnel of towering trees that blocked out most of the sunlight. The air grew colder, and the sounds of the world outside diminished, replaced by the gentle rustling of leaves and the occasional chirping of birds. Emerging from the tree line, we found ourselves in a vast valley, surrounded by majestic peaks reaching for the heavens, it was a sight that filled us with awe and a sense of insignificance. The valley had a gothic charm, as if the mountains guarded ancient secrets and whispered tales of forgotten times. The sunlight struggled to penetrate the tall peaks, casting long shadows that stretched across the valley floor. In the distance, we spotted a small town nestled among the rugged terrain. It consisted of no more than 10 to 15 houses, their architecture simple and weathered. Hoping to find someone who could provide us with some directions or local knowledge about Gomi Fala, we approached the seemingly deserted place. However, as we got closer, a strange feeling settled in our chests. There was an eerie stillness, as if time had come to a halt and the world around us held its breath. As we entered the town, a sense of unease washed over us. 
The streets were devoid of life, and the atmosphere was thick with an uncanny silence. The houses stood like ancient architecture, their windows and doors closed, giving no glimpse of what lay beyond. Undeterred, we decided to split up, knocking on the doors, hoping to find someone, anyone, willing to shed some light on our destination. We agreed to meet back at the town center after thoroughly exploring the area. The anticipation and curiosity fueled our steps as we set off on our individual quests. I walked up to the nearest house, knocking on the door. Hello? Uh, we apologize for the intrusion, I called out. We just need some directions. After a while of silence, a deep and distorted voice emerged from one of the houses to the left of me. Two kilometers to the west, you'll find a narrow path that leads there, but you don't want to go there. The voice warned us. His voice seemed eerie and loud. It echoed throughout the area, sending shivers down my body, like waves of cold water. A and L rushed over, puzzled. Why did he sound like that? A whispered, his voice trembling. Are you alone here? L asked the man who spoke to us, his tone filled with concern. There was no response this time. We stood in silence, awaiting an answer. Suddenly, an inexplicable noise emerged, growing louder and more distinct by the second. It was laughter. Wicked and malevolent laughter, echoing through the air, followed by unsettling weeping and crying. It was coming from each and every house around us. The cacophony intensified, forcing us to cover our ears. Then as abruptly as it had begun, the sounds ceased. The silence that followed was deafening, None of us dared to speak, we simply stood frozen, listening and waiting. Then the voice uttered one last warning, a sentence that still echoes through my mind. Don't go where the shadows lurk. That caught us off guard. Not knowing what this person meant, we looked at each other, confused. Look, A whispered, pointing his finger behind us. We looked at where he was pointing. My stomach sank as I looked around. The curtains in every house had been slightly drawn to the side as if someone was watching. Real weirdos living out here, I mustered the courage to suggest. I guess, L responded, his voice filled with unease. Let's get out of here. Not wanting to spend another second there, we hastily retreated to our car, driving away eager to distance ourselves from the unsettling encounter. As we discussed the situation, we reluctantly decided to follow the directions the creepy man had indicated. I know this never ends well in movies. This was real life. Besides that, we hoped that there might be some truth or resolution to his cryptic message. Nothing like some paranormal stories to get the blood flowing. After a short drive, we reached a point where the road ended, and a narrow, winding path led up the mountain. It was clear our car would not be able to make that journey. The path ahead was obscured by tall trees, but it seemed to ascend further into the mountain. Left with no other options, we unloaded our belongings and embarked on a hike on foot. We trudged forward, step by step, but there was no sign of a pond or a clearing. As time passed, we found ourselves at the point where the trail vanished into the dense forest. Darkness had settled in, prompting us to retrieve our flashlights to illuminate the way amidst the towering trees. After nearly an hour of hiking, the pond was nowhere to be found, and exhaustion had gripped us. We decided to take a brief rest, allowing our tired legs a moment of respite. The night had completely descended, enveloping us in darkness. Nourishing ourselves with some snacks to regain energy, we looked back and realized turning back now was no longer an option. We'd come too far to give up. The path was dark and rough. Fortunately, our powerful flashlights provided ample illumination, enabling us to continue our ascent. Gathering our determination, we resumed our journey along the path. Another 20 minutes of walking brought us to the edge of the forest revealing the site we'd been seeking. There it was, 
just beyond a cluster of trees. The pond, nestled amidst vibrant green grass. Regret had already set for not arriving earlier to witness it bathed in the sunlight, but the promise of tomorrow filled us with renewed hope. As fatigue gave way to a sense of accomplishment, we set up camp near the pond. Our tents were erected, and we started a crackling fire to ward off the chilly and subtle wind coming down the mountain. The peaceful ambience of the moonlit scene brought a welcome tranquility after the challenges we'd faced. Underneath the star-studded sky, I couldn't help but find solace in the beauty and vastness of nature. Stories and laughter filled the air as we sat around the campfire, cherishing every moment. We ate and drank, laughing at memories we made as kids. As good as it was sitting there and reliving our fondest of memories, exhaustion eventually caught up with us. We then settled into our sleeping bags. I closed my eyes, welcoming sleep, eagerly awaiting the dawn and the wonders it could reveal. After some time, my sleep was disturbed. I woke up in the middle of the night to a throbbing headache. My body ached all over. Groggily, I reached for my phone and saw that it was 3.13 in the morning. Disoriented and in pain, I tried to ignore the discomfort and go back to sleep. However, amidst my exhaustion, I heard a faint, crying noise, which sounded oddly familiar. It seemed distant, as if carried by a soft breeze. I hesitated for a moment, contemplating whether to investigate or not. Convinced it was merely in my imagination, conjuring up memories of a past traumatic event, I decided to brush it off, forcing myself back to sleep. As I settled back into my sleeping bag, my thoughts became consumed by the pain in my head and body. I forgot what I'd heard. Each ache seemed to intensify, making it nearly impossible to find relief. I tossed and turned, desperately seeking comfort but sleep seemed to have eluded me. Finally, after what felt like hours, I fell back to sleep, saving me from the pain and fatigue. The morning arrived, and as I was awakened, I was pleasantly surprised to find myself free of any pain. My head felt clear, my body seemed weightless. After a long, satisfying stretch, I got up, stepping up out of my tent. I was greeted by a breathtakingly beautiful sight a large pond surrounded by sun-kissed grass. The air carried a refreshing chill, and the sun's warmth was gentle, not overpowering. The scene was simply captivating, leaving me in awe. Eager to start the day, I kindled the fire and began to prepare breakfast. As time passed, Elle and Day emerged from their tents, their faces mirroring the astonishment and delight I'd experienced. Worth it, exclaimed El as he stretched his body. We settled down, sinking our feet into the soft, damp grass, savoring our breakfast together. Engrossed in conversation, we marveled at our surroundings, enjoying some steaming cups of tea. It was a truly remarkable moment. As the day unfolded, we immersed ourselves in a myriad of enjoyable activities, engaging in board games and card games, relishing delectable snacks and refreshing drinks, the weather remained flawless throughout the day, adding to the perfection of our time together. Night soon fell once more, casting its darkness all over. We gathered around the campfire, sipping on hot chocolate that actually lacked any real flavor. As usual, we found ourselves reminiscing about the foolish deeds of our childhood. It quickly evolved into a playful competition, each of us trying to outdo the others with tales of our youthful mischief Looking back now, it's amusing to think that three grown adults were engaged in a light-hearted debate about who had been the most unruly child. Eventually, we decided to bring out the old Monopoly board game. Just as we were about to begin, El announced that he needed to take a leak. He wandered off behind the tents, venturing a bit further down into the valley. A and I continued chatting and setting up the game. About ten minutes passed, and L had yet to make an appearance. Growing concerned, A went back to his tent to get his flashlight, while I activated mine on my phone. With the fire's glow still fresh in our eyes, the area behind the tents was shrouded in darkness. 
A went looking to the right, while I cautiously followed L's path, carefully navigating through the night. Turning left, I found myself facing a cluster of large boulders. I walked up to the boulders, shining my light between them. There he was, standing, his back towards me. Thank goodness, I muttered to myself. L was standing about 15 to 20 feet away, his gaze fixed on a pair of trees. He didn't turn around or acknowledge my presence. I couldn't help but wonder what had captured his attention in the distance. What's he looking at? I wondered. What are you looking for, man? It's pitch black out there, I quipped. He waved his hand, signaling me to stop talking. I got the message, and I fell silent, walking closer to him. As I approached, my eyes scanned the area, searching for any signs of what had caught his interest. But there was nothing, just an empty expanse. Hey, I whispered once I reached his side. Shh, he replied. Listen. I followed his instructions, straining to hear something amid the complete and utter silence. The nocturnal life seemed non-existent, as if everything, everything, had fallen asleep. Yeah, it's pretty quiet, I murmured. That's not what I mean, L whispered back. Just listen. Once again, I focused my senses on the surroundings. Then I heard it. Faint, rustling noises. A chill ran down my spine. The sound was subtle, but undeniably close. This area wasn't known for bears or mountain lions, but it was our first time visiting, so we couldn't be certain. Let's get back to camp. Slowly. I called out to El. Yeah, let's go he replied, nodding his head in agreement. As we turned around to walk back, a sudden sense of dread washed over me, causing goosebumps to ripple across my skin. Glancing at Al, I could tell he was experiencing the same unnerving feeling. It was written all over his face. My knees weakened, and a throbbing headache began to come back. Before I could utter a word, a faint, chilling laughter emerged from behind us, Initially low, it gradually grew in intensity. Before long, the laughter became deafening, shaking us to our very core. Like startled deer caught in the blinding glare of headlights, we stood frozen, unsure of what to do. Terror held us in its grip as we listened helplessly. Then abruptly, the laughter ceased. A rustling sound emanated from the two trees ahead of us. L swiftly retrieved his flashlight and directed it toward the source of the noise. What we witnessed next will forever be etched into my memory. Just beyond the reach of the trees, a mysterious black silhouette stood, facing away from us. We stood there, paralyzed with disbelief, struggling to comprehend what we were seeing. It was a challenge to discern its true form. We couldn't tell its size because it was a fair distance away from us, L and I remained rooted to the spot, attempting to unravel the enigma before us. The figure slowly emerged from behind the trees. Even recalling that moment now fills me with terror, and I can't help but shudder as I write these words. The entity appeared completely devoid of color, as if enveloped in an inky darkness. I mean, it was even darker than the blackness around us. With a swift motion, it turned its face and peered its head from behind one of the trees. In an ill-fated decision, L directed his flashlight towards its face, a choice we would soon regret. What we saw sent shivers down our spines. Two eyes reflected the beam of L's flashlight, but what truly churned my stomach was the colossal, unnerving grin it bore, unveiling a multitude of teeth arranged in a disordered fashion. For a brief moment, it felt as though time itself had frozen. The air grew heavy with an eerie stillness until a distant sound shattered the silence. It was A's voice calling out to us and as a result unsettling whatever presence was standing before us. We watched in terror as its colossal grin vanished, leaving only its piercing eyes visible in the dark. Not long after, 
A ghastly sound escaped its twisted mouth, a bone-chilling scream, which reverberated through the valley and beyond. Soon after, the haunting cries began, accompanied by the emergence of the entity from behind the tree. It revealed itself in its entirety, sending shivers down our spines. Overwhelmed by the sight, I stumbled backward, tripping over a jagged rock and falling to the ground. Yet, El remained steadfast, his trembling hand clutching the light as he defiantly illuminated the abomination before us. As seconds ticked by, the entity's mournful wail subsided, and it simply stood there, observing us as intensely as we observed it. From behind the imposing boulders, A continued to call out to us, his voice filled with both urgency and concern. It didn't take long for A to find us. When he did, he didn't say a word, but it was evident from his expression that he too had witnessed what we had stumbled upon. Hey, man, let's go back, I whispered urgently to El. Before he could reply, a sound to our right shattered the tense atmosphere. Laughter, followed by more laughter and weeping, from the left, then from all around us. A chilling realization gripped us. Whatever was out there, we had unknowingly entered their territory, their din. The haunting chorus of laughter and crying grew louder, assaulting our ears and our sanity. We instinctively covered our ears, not only to block out the deafening noise, but also to shield ourselves from the bone-chilling horror. I squeezed my eyes shut, overwhelmed. Then, just like the other day, as fast as the noise began, it ceased, leaving my ears ringing in its wake. Slowly, I released my grip, but I dared not open my eyes. I could hear L gasping for breath, attempting to utter something to me. But before any words could form, A shouted from behind us. Run! His voice trembled with fear. I forced my eyes open and was met with the sight of hundreds of pairs of eyes reflecting our lights. That was enough to jolt us out of our paralyzed state. Struggling to my feet, I saw L already turning around. Without a second thought, we sprinted up the hill, A urgently urging us to hurry. As we fled, I glanced back at A, whose face had turned ashen with terror. Soon after, the horrendous sound of heavy footsteps reached my ears, growing ever closer. I risked a brief look behind me, and my eyes were met by the grotesque eyes hovering above the massive grin from before, now looming ominously closer. My heart threatened to give out then and there. We managed to push through, making it back to the campsite. Dizzy from the exertion, I collapsed onto the ground. The entity still lingered out there, but to our luck, they seemed to avoid the vicinity of our campfire. They lurked in the darkness, just beyond the fire's glow. Taking a moment to catch our breath, we rose to our feet, each clutching a wooden branch we had collected earlier, our only defense. With their capabilities still unknown to us, the best we could do was wait and pray they didn't come for us. Soon it became evident that they were intentionally avoiding the fire, giving us a brief moment of relief. However, a pressing issue remained, the shortage of wood to sustain us throughout the night. The consequences of the fire going out were unknown and unsettling. Standing there with wooden branches tightly gripped in our hands, we began to hear whispers echoing just beyond our sight in the darkness. They said fire, kill, hungry. Silence enveloped us as none of us dared to utter a word. We even stifled our breathing, fearing the unknown reaction if any of us had made a noise. Hours passed and the inevitable moment arrived. The fire started to dim. We had only the branches in our hands remaining. Breaking them into smaller pieces, we tried to make it last longer, but soon even those pieces dwindled away. As if the creatures outside were aware that their feeding time drew near every passing minute, the sinister laughing resumed. We were at a loss, unsure of what to do. With our unfortunate demise imminent, we sat down in defeat. The weight of hopelessness hung heavily over us, and not a word was spoken. As the surrounding sounds grew louder and the fire weakened, A stood up, 
uttering a few words that became our salvation. Our jackets, A shouted. Throw them in the fire. Swiftly, he removed his own jacket. A glimmer of hope shone upon us once again. Carefully, we burned our jackets, ensuring the fire stayed alive. As the flames grew stronger, the laughter ceased, replaced by whispered words of death and hunger that echoed around us. We huddled together, taking turns sitting by the fire, desperately trying to keep it ablaze. The gentle breeze that caressed our faces carried with it a poison, tainted by the eerie whispers and the occasional wails of the hellish creatures lurking in the dark. It felt like an eternity had passed, but finally the long-awaited dawn began to emerge. Never before had I felt such overwhelming gratitude for the sight of the sunrise. Its rays washed over the mountain cliffs, the haunting whispers faded away. In their place, a serene silence descended, interrupted only by the gentle rustling of leaves in the wind. I couldn't help but shed tears of joy. That night, we narrowly escaped death, or a fate far worse. The image the rising sun revealed will forever be etched in my memory. Light, the greatest gift we could receive. We remained rooted to our spots, unwilling to move, until the sun had fully illuminated the surroundings. We lacked the strength to pack our belongings properly, hastily grabbing only the essentials and leaving the rest behind. Our descent down the mountain proved arduous, as exhaustion from a sleepless night and the lingering terror clung to our every step. Eventually, we reached our car, loading up our belongings. In silence, El took the wheel and drove us back towards civilization. As we passed through the small town one last time, my gaze fell upon the house where that haunting voice had spoken to us. Its door stood slightly ajar, a silhouette peeking through the crack. The thing peeking through was wearing a giant grin, partially visible with one eye. It looked at us, as if challenging us to visit again. At the face of such unsettling sight, I remained silent, diverting my gaze forward, determined not to look back. Much time has passed since that harrowing incident, yet its effects linger within us. We still hang out together, sometimes venturing into the outdoors for camping and hiking, always armed and cautious, avoiding places with unknown and unexplained histories. I'm not sure we'll ever get over that night. However, I can confidently say that it bestowed upon my life a newfound significance, that when you face death, we truly feel alive. If you ever visit Iraqi Kurdistan, don't go where the shadows lurk. Before I go, I'd like to share a few pictures with you. Three of them were taken while hiking on the night we arrived. I randomly took the pictures of the trails we went through to save memory. The remaining two were captured in the morning we descended. Interestingly, in the last two photos, while we began our hike down, we noticed something peculiar. A figure which looked a lot like one of the entities from the former night, watching us from high up on the mountain. Hence, I quickly snapped pictures of it. What was it? Why don't hunt in Wyoming at night anymore? From Sea Philly 100. A new friend of mine recently told this story to me after a couple of beers, without which I'm not sure he would have told me at all. I could truly sense the earnestness and fear in his voice. I'll tell it to you from his perspective. Growing up in Wyoming is to grow up hunting, at least for my family. We've hunted just about everything you can legally hunt in the state, and then some. Not proud of it, nor am I particularly remorseful. Nowadays, I don't hunt much, but growing up, we'd go out all the time. A few of my friends have claimed to see Bigfoot, but I always kind of laughed it off. Sure, I smelled some funky stuff out there, but I never did see it myself. It's pretty hard to actually believe in something like that. But I tell you what, I wish it was Bigfoot we saw that night back in 2018, when I was home and went out hunting with my dad. We were hunting for elk with ATVs out in the snowy mountain range. We even had some elk urine and were bugling to attract a big bull. My dad had a thermal scope, 
I was using it to scope out a ridgeline. Meanwhile, my dad was walking down to the ravine, trying to flush something up my way. As I looked through the scope, I saw something moving down the ridgeline towards us, from the opposite direction of where my dad had gone. At first, I thought it was an elk, due to its size and antlers. Then I thought maybe it was a moose, on account of its height, but I couldn't really make out many details. The thing that threw me, though, was it wasn't moving like an elk or a moose. Its movement reminded me more of a rodent, how it would have these quick little bursts of speed, then stop. Its front legs appeared to be shorter than its hind legs, giving its back a curved slouch, which really gave me the creeps. With horror, I realized we were upwind from this apparition, so it could likely smell the elk urine we'd so liberally applied to our clothes. This thing was hunting us. It was even using the trees for cover, but I could see it had huge antlers, and that's how I knew it was looking in my direction. I started hearing this loud clicking sound, and this is going to sound crazy, but it sounded kind of like how the predator sounds in the predator films with that creepy clicking noise. At that moment, I became acutely aware of our position on the food chain that old feeling of peace and safety that had always been synonymous with being out in nature was totally gone. I knew I had to make a move, or this thing would soon be on top of me. I quickly got my stuff together and took off down towards where my dad had gone. I intersected his path as he was making his way back up to my position. I quietly told him what I'd seen, trying to keep my fear in check. He looked confused and I could tell he didn't really believe me. Then, the clicking started back up again. I scanned back in the direction of the sound with my scope, and I could still see it. I passed my dad the scope, pointing to where it was. He looked through the scope for a few seconds, before looking back at me, and I could tell he was sort of shocked. We booked it down to our ATVs, then drove back down to the truck and trailer where we loaded up the ATVs and left. We never really talked about what we saw that night, but sometimes I would catch my dad staring off into the distance, and I knew he was thinking about it. I think it kind of boggled his mind, seeing something like that after spending his whole life out in the woods. But he's never really been the type of guy to open up about his feelings, so I don't really know what he thinks about it. At times, I've convinced myself it really was just a big old bull elk. But then again, bull elk don't make that sound. They don't move like that. I can't speak for my dad, but I know I won't be going hunting out there anytime soon. That's my friend's story. Does anyone know what the animal might have been? Or know anyone who's had a similar experience? Thanks for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed the show, you can support us in a number of other ways. You can go to eeriecast.store to buy some creepy t-shirts or coffee mugs. Go to eeriecast.com to listen to and follow this show and our other scary podcasts on your favorite podcasting app, or follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails for more screams and memes. Before I go, be sure to send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.